Yeah. Uh, Miko's the one on the left. Really? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm the little one just there. Yeah. You'd never know, would you? Um, we're, um, we're originally illustrators, and um, illustrating for people like English Heritage, uh, National Trust, and what have you, with pen and ink and watercolours, and doing our best to um, provide accessible but concise and accurate uh, paintings and illustrations. Um, became interested in um, 3D work when I was at college. And uh, this is one of the, I had to reach back a long way to get this, dug this out at the bottom of the, the chest. This is uh, my first uh, 3D Max effort. Uh, and it's uh, a building at a place called Grey Hill, not very far away from here, um, overlooking Kerwent and uh, up in the hills. It was originally a Saxon asset, and um, as time went by, it, it developed into a small holding. Uh, and this is a reconstruction of how it would have looked around about 1920, just before it became derelict. Um, I've done it this way to illustrate how basically you're working with a laser pointer, um, <laughs> working with meshes, uh, you're working with polygons, booleans, vertices, so my life became sort of like uh, cluttered with all the jargon associated with, with modelling in 3D, using 3D Max. Um, the textures on this I took a lot of time over, um, the tiles especially, um, each uh, strip of tiles was done individually and um, the paths were created in Adobe Illustrator. Um, the actual textures were taken from the, the, the real life uh, building, um, me bounced precariously on a ladder to try and get a perpendicular shot that was on a roof and then the resulting photographs were chopped out and applied in, in 3D Max to the strips. So basically what you've got, to cut a long story short, you've got a, lo a layer of overlapping um, tiles. Ha! Just going on to the next one. That got me interested uh, in, in, in carrying on. This is uh, Nico and I's first venture together. Um, this is a detail from uh, a job we did. It focused. Um, and this, uh, this was for the community project, uh, heritage funded community project called The Town Unearthed. The archaeology was done by Canterbury Archaeological Trust, who incidentally won an award for the rescue archaeology they were doing. Um, I've brought this in to show you that, you know, we're interested in, in, in quite a, a high degree of, of detail. You won't see this in the finished product because this is just a small part of a large picture and you just won't pick the detail up. But what it does give us is an asset and it's just something that you can do now as a digital artist that you couldn't do before as a watercolour artist. You can create assets and use them again over and over, modifying them each time so that you know, I can take the ladder out and use the ladder in a different place, etc. etc. This, uh, this belongs to Mika, and it's a, a, a test. Yes, <coughs> test to, to see how the vegetation works out. Well, Drew was modeling the architecture, because we had to, to make uh, a couple of still images from, uh, from an Iron Age settlement there in, uh, in the Roman villa. And Drew did all the modeling on the architectural part, and I was, in the meantime, doing uh, all the landscape reconstruction for the surrounding landscapes. So while Drew was doing the Building the houses, I was trying a test on, on uh, what vegetation would look like and how the how the bigger area is going to to look. So this was done after a site visit, which we yep. both attended. Uh, many many photographs were taken of the landscape as it exists. For reference material. For reference, yeah. Um, and that again, 
Yeah, save vegetation. Vegetation. Just uh, some experimenting in there to get the feel of the, of the final image right. And this would be the hand sculpted uh, base model on which all the houses would eventually be placed and the vegetation is, is, is being put on. Because just to illustrate that it's a very hands on uh, sculpting way of uh, making things. You probably recognize the areas for the round houses yeah. and the ditches for drainage and, and, and what have you. So um, we work with the archaeologists and, and <coughs> historians very, very closely. You know, so they, they dictate um, basically <coughs> what we're doing, and as interpreters, then we can build on that. So the more data we get to begin with, um, the, the better result. Basically. Uh, those are a group of round houses. Yeah. So Drew's, when Drew's finished with the models, he sends them to me. Send them over to Amsterdam. And I, uh, I open them in, uh, in the software I use is different than the software Drew uses for the model. So I have to check all the texturing is, is, is come over all right and uh, Again, these sorts. the textures for the roundhouses, the roofs of the roundhouses were taken from um, actual reconstructions down on the Somerset levels near Glastonbury. Um, and I, I, I gained permission to go and act like an idiot with a 40-foot pole with a camera on the top on a timer and carefully went around this roundhouse taking picture after picture after picture and then stitched them together with Photoshop so I had a nice round, round thing and then it's basically draping it over the model so you end up with something that is as close as you can get to read thatching. Um, that uh, scene was developed to show the Roman occupation on the same site. So this is East Cliff at Folkestone still. Um, it's quite interesting, the, um, the rescue archaeology was carried out because the cliff has been eroding, and it's eroded since Roman times more than half a kilometre. It's now threatening the <laughs> it's now threatening the edge of this building here, the bathhouse, and the foundations are basically disappearing. So um, Cat were um, doing this, and the town and Earth were asking for a reconstruction before it was too late for it to disappear. Um, there's a quick animation just to prove to the client that we had actually done all sides. Um, it's a uh, Basically, it goes to illustrate that once the, once the image has been made, once the model has been made, the client has unlimited um, viewpoints from which he can obtain an image. Now, as illustrators, we're interested in the final image. Um, clients are coming to us for a 2D representation at the moment. Animation is great, but we tend to go heavy on the textures. We can go right up to the buildings and you can see the sandstone, sandstone textures, or plaster textures. Um, and so animating these plus the landscape would be, would, be would, would need a render farm effectively. So multiple computers all chugging away night and day to actually do this. So that's the front of the place. That's a sea view. Um, Interesting because uh, it's quite an imposing place. Uh, the historian wanted these towers put on. Elevations are subjective. You know, they, they can find bits of tile that might prove that there's a tile roof or shingles. But, um, elevations are subjective. So that was after consultation with uh, Keith Parfit. And um, it was uh, it's subjective, but it may have been the residence of the commander of the Roman fleet in the third century. In which case, that guy, um, Cass, uh, Cassius or something, um, Cassius, yeah, subsequently became emperor of Gaul and Britannia um, and survived for uh, 10 years, I think, something like 286 to 296. That could have been his res residence. From here, you can see France and you can see the ships going backwards and forwards over the channel. So it's not with on, it's not without the bands of um, reality. 
moving on. We've got, uh, this is a 1730 um, etching of uh, Hearst Castle at the Surrey. And um, this was one of Henry's device castles. And I love device castles. They're great. They're, they're just really brilliant to actually take apart. Um, this is how it looks at the moment. The core is still Henry's castle. The Victorians added these immense artillery gun positions. And basically, they filled in the bastions with concrete. Them, you know, so although the core is still sort of you know, demonstrably there, it's been heavily modified. Um, so English heritage wanted, English heritage wanted a reconstruction. Now these are great. These are my favourites. These are Ministry of Works um, plans, and they're little minor works of art themselves. And, and these are my preferred way of working because they're accurate and they're easy to follow. They're very accessible. And um, when doing one of these things, um, you get interested in the geometry. And you knew that Henry was a bit of a polymath. Um, he had the best education going. He really knew what he was doing. He, he designed a Hampton called Palace with Wolseley. Um, helped Wolseley out when he was doing it. <clears throat> and when he got rid of Wolseley, he took over a lot of the designs himself. So, he almost bankrupted the country building these things. Um, and most of them never had a full complement of guns because he couldn't afford them. But he did have a hand in designing them. And this one had a 12 sided keep. Um, quite massive. And subsequently, a 12 sided outer door. So I thought, right, I've got to stick the bastions on. Uh, and, and this, this is what really makes it work. So I thought, logically, the bastions should look like that and attach themselves to the outer wall. Uh, but it didn't work out. Now, what Henry or his architect, who was a German guy, uh, Henry von Hasch, Hasch something or other, um, from Bohemia, uh, we did a lot of stuff, Carlisle Castle, Deal, Dover, a lot of stuff. Um, he had a hand in a lot, and I can imagine him and Henry working this out. Uh, basically, took a line that ran off the outside wall, and a line that ran off the outside wall, came to an apex, took the diameter from there to there, and then put in bastion. Now the green line illustrates what I thought was going to happen in the first place. The black dotted line shows the actual reality. And it's interesting. Uh, it's, a, it's important to get it right, because if you don't get that right at the beginning, everything gets thrown out. But it's a, it's a lovely sort of like piece of um, geometry. And um, to prove it works, uh, you can overlay it on the plan, and that's how it should work. So instead of slavishly following the, um, the original survey, I wanted to understand how the geometry worked. You know, and that's how it works. Don't know why. Whether it was something about space, or maybe um, angles of, of, of gunnery fire, I'm, I, I have absolutely no idea why they chose to do it that way. But that's the way they did it. And um, subsequently, I uh, was able to sort of do an exploded model. And a lot of this is a labour of love, because you don't see it. You know, <laughs> this is in the guidebook somewhere, and you don't see, you know, you don't see the, oops, you don't see the spiral staircase. You don't see all the other little staircases, but it's absolutely fascinating you know, to do. You see um, the falconets that covered the, the, the approach to the walls. And, um, it was, it's a, a masterpiece. It was also a blind alley, because uh, these things were, well, this one was never used, but it wasn't actually built to withstand a serious bombardment. It had hollow bastions, which is why later on they were filled with concrete. Um, but even so, it was, it was a nice thing to do. 
start pulling again. Yeah, this is this is how the landscape starts. Yeah, basically. So um, it's important, especially when you're no, but it works. And I, 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 I can guess where the moat is. Yeah. So Drew wanted some boys. So I gave him some boys. Yeah. This is they're quite happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They, um, no, no, should we skip that? Yeah, we can skip that. <laughs> it's just to illustrate that we had to to make some people with with. Yeah. We had come back very small on the final image, so yeah. We just put some made up uh, some clothing, the clothing ourselves. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, yeah. Very handsome. Um, and the final illustration looks a bit like that. Um, there's a color cap in the road. So, um, this looks across to the Isle of Wight, totally commanding the, the western approaches to the Solent. Uh, there's a, a corresponding castle on the Isle of Wight. And, but it was never used. It was never used. The guns were massive, they were uh, culverines, demi-culverines, um, and they almost look out of scale with the characters, but the barrels of a demi-culverine was about 11 feet long. Um, so from here to you know, beyond the sea, absolutely massive weapons. Um, another device castle, Henry's um, St. Moore's, opposite Pendennis down at Falmouth, the Cornwall. And um, found out another little thing whilst doing the plans for both castles. Um, that's the plan of St. Moore's. That's the plan of Pendennis. And you see the later addition of the shells around the edge. Uh, the records for these castles were lost in the Blitz. They were kept in Plymouth, which were absolutely flat. Um, so no one knew exactly if the guy doing the castle was the same guy. Uh, I managed to figure out that if you overlay the two castles, you find a series of, of coincidences that keeps uh, at the same uh, chemise and lines almost perfectly to the, the width of the, the red St. Moors up from the front. The four buildings uh, more or less horizontally about the same length. So, I mean, I would be happy to say that the same guy was in, involved in both castles. Uh, but that's just my opinion. I'm not an academic. But getting it right allows you to sort of like do that, which uh, finally informed the watercolour I did. So I didn't go ahead and texture this. But again, really nice and sort of complicated design. Stuff going on. Um, yeah, this is a, this is an ongoing project that me and Nico are working on. This is Leicester Abbey in Suffolk. Um, this was uh, an Augustan Augustinian abbey. Um, Leslie, it was the Augustian order called the Primum. Premonstratensians. Premonstratensians. Yes, that's the ones. Um, yeah, they were they were quite an austere little order. Um, you may notice there's only one chimney. Um, <laughs> so they lived in abject um, uh, poverty and froze in the winter. I, I did argue for chimneys on the guest block, but apparently guests had to uh, suffer as well. This uh, this was an abbey that was moved. Uh, from Minnesmere, quite close to the coast, kept getting flooded. So around about the 1300s, it was moved here and financed by the first Earl of Suffolk. Um, it's interesting to see that some features are very fine. You've got early English Gothic perpendicular windows, which are really, really nicely done. But some of it is absolutely shabby. And I can, I can surmise, um, along with the archaeologist, uh, Stephen Brindle, that we reckon it was slung together with bits and pieces from the old abbey. And it was during a time, of course, when there were lots of plagues. So there was a shortage of manpower, skilled manpower. There were some master craftsmen who, who worked on the finer details. But a lot of it were, were, was put up by um, people who maybe um, 
weren't so skilled. Uh, of course, it was one. Of, it was one of the first abbeys dissolved by Henry, so which is great. Um, because it lets us reconstruct it. So Henry's done us a great service. The landscape around it um, was recreated according to um, after discussion with the archaeologists. The ditch here was cut by the monks, but it was taken from a, a stream that was diverted. So there's a culvert right the way under there, underneath the rear daughter, which comes out the back, which is where the monks had their toilets. Um, so this put that here with this. Uh, and that is a test that began it. Yeah, landscape, uh, send Miko over a yeah, um, untexture yeah. thing, yeah, just to sort of like this is a contrast to the final image. Just to show kind of how we work. Yeah. And that's a, a test for the textures. Texture. Yeah. Um, so that worked out. Right? So once you've got the, the, the big external building, which you can look at from all sides, uh, it was time to do some of the interiors. So you could take parts of that ex ex external building and work on the in interiors. Um, Lyston was a mixture of kind of Romanesque type, really early stuff from the first abbey, um, and you know the, the, the uh, early English perpendicular stuff as well. Uh, I think the last um, last inventory before it was demolished stated that it had a couple of candlesticks, uh, a white altar, not a lot else really, um, it had a few cows and sheep. At its best it supported about 15 monks and habit. Um, so this is the choir which Miko's rendered out of view which uh, he's been using something called volumetric lighting which is basically light bouncing off of particles in the air. Um, which gives a kind of a nice sort of like drama, um, drama. yeah, drama, and and sort of effect, sort of things um, coming through window windows, windows. Hard, yes. yes um, <coughs> this is a gatehouse. This is really funny. This is a Tudor gatehouse that someone spent an awful lot of money bolting onto the side of one of the earlier buildings. Um, of course, it was pulled down a few years after it was built. So that's all that's left. That and there's a little bit of detail there. And uh, it's fun from an early point of view to actually count the courses of bricks and then replicate them in the model. So, I mean, we're getting something quite, quite accurate there. Um, yeah, how many? Second. Second. <laughs> oh, there's another one. Um, oh, get out. <laughs> Um, yeah, this is the east face, uh, the quiet. Um, one of the nice points about Lyston was the fact they use flint infants, so they use nap flint, um, and they, 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 they put them little things like that um, all over the end. Some of that still exists, and the rest is uh, supposition. But, um, yeah. Yeah, and this is this is kind of where we're going to end up. Um, so Miko and I have been sort of like concentrating on doing um, illustrations for organisations that rely on a lot of detail and basically um, take the place of the watercolours and the pen and inks that we've been doing before. However, uh, with augmented reality, um, and this is as you probably guess. Uh, it gives an awful lot of work for model makers in the future. This is probably going to catch on. I've been banging on to Glastonbury Abbey that, that you know, this is the way they ought to do it um, without much success. The French do it a lot more. Uh, the French are very, very sort of tech savvy when it comes to actually infotainment and education. Um, they're really on top of it. Uh, Glastonbury's sister abbey down somewhere in the Vondi. Uh, they've even got holograms. Oh, yeah, holograms. Uh, there you go. In. And there you are. You've got monks wandering around in front of you. Uh, 
which is great because they used to put buildings back together with the breeze blocks, but now they're doing it digitally, which is great. And that, as you've been hearing something of, is an Oculus Rift. Um, that's the latest incarnation of the headset. On one hand, you've got augmented reality, working off GPS, looking at things, and this is virtual, this is immersive. Um, and up to now, guess what it's been used for? Yeah, uh, the porn industry are well into this. Um, <laughs> as I found out, and the games industry. Um, so they're obviously leading the way. Um, but I think it offers incredible scope for accurate data-driven reconstructions. Um, as has been pointed out, this is what you see when you're looking into the front of a, an obvious route. It's a stereoscopic view. The parallax has all been sorted out, the motion lag, the whole thing is so it's totally immersive. Um, I've got a friend in Vancouver who's a bit of an alien. He likes to race cars online and he does it like semi professionally. You know, so he actually entered competitions online. Uh, he's very good. I've seen his rig. He has three 42 inch screens and you sat in front of them and it was. Peripheral, right around to peripheral vision. It was, it was absolutely incredible. He's just jumped them. He's just thrown them away, and he's got himself one of these. Uh, he says it's mine. Really. You can look down. You can look at the tarmac whizzing by beneath your feet. Um, so this is probably going to catch on because the price point has been coming down. You can now buy them for three hundred and fifty dollars. They're not a mainstream sell. They're being sold as development. Kids, <laughs> um, but I guess that's you know it's only a matter of time. So Johnny at Christmas is not only going to want a PlayStation, he's going to want the headset to go with it, um, and it's slowly becoming affordable and realistic. Uh, ten years ago, I visited the Escher Museum in the Hague, over in Holland, and on the top floor they had a virtual reality suit. Mm. These really great big things that you strapped onto your head, and um, then you were bombarded with all sorts of improbable geometric shapes and all the rest of it. It was it was good. That's ten years ago. I mean, things have moved on. Things have moved on a lot. And uh, I mean, if you don't watch out, you can end up looking like that. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. I, I, I had a thought when you were talking about people seeing it in the chapel. You know, wearing an Oculus Rift, whether you'd start to join in. That'd be awful, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, yeah, so that's, that's what me and Miko do. Um, at the moment, we're, 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 we're concentrating on high-end um, graphics for panels, guidebooks, um, displays, exhibitions. But there's going to come a time when we'll gather enough computers together to sort of like animate, but we want to animate to a very, very high standard. Um, so we want to animate to a level where you can actually walk up to something and still think you're actually you know, in reality. Um, that's the way to go. Thank you very much. <laughs>